down and find your places, grab your song books, and turn to page 571. We'll sing all four verses of When We All Get to Heaven. Let's all stand together. Activity. We are going to be wearing masks when we go to the activity. All right, so make sure you have a mask, and it's going to be at Lock Haven Baptist Church. Uh, it's actually uh, the camp that's in Georgia that we used to, went last year for our junior camp is doing these camps on the go. It ones in Orlando for teens, so that's what we're going to be doing on the 24th and 25th. And then the other announcement I have is today at five o'clock. For anyone interested in the audiovisual Facebook live streaming options that we have for uh, going forward with this at, at our church, uh, we would have that meeting today at 5 o'clock. If you'd like to be here, we'll be meeting here in the auditorium. But we're going to discuss the options that we have and just try to see what the best option might be for us to continue with Facebook Live. We will be continuing Facebook Live, so don't get scared. All right, everybody out there in Facebook? 
but we just want to know what the best way to continue is. So hope to, that you can make it if you're interested. Thank you for being here today. As you know, Brother Stevens takes care of a lot of things around here. <clears throat> Little things he wants to know. <clears throat> excuse me. What's a pastor do? Well, he takes care of a lot of things. <laughs> And he gets things thrown at him every week. He says, you're in charge. And he just does a fine job. I don't, I don't have to look over his shoulder. I've never liked looking over people's shoulders. And I wouldn't want anybody looking over my shoulder. I don't, I just let him go. And he takes care of things like they ought to be done. And on this issue of uh, the streaming, he has put in a lot of time, a lot of research, He's going to be discussing tonight pros and cons of two options before our church. Well, not before the church, but before those who have come and expressed an interest. And eventually it's going to be before you anyway. So there are two options. One is the type option that we're using right now. And the other is going to a camera situation. So he has uh, delved into both of them. He's drawn up the ideas as well as he can regarding pros and cons on each one. And I just appreciate the people who have attended. Uh, they have given their opinions, and nobody has come in with an agenda. I like that. Right. That's important Amen. in a church. Because when you've got an agenda, that means this is what I want to see happen, and it's just going to happen. Now, that, that's just an agenda. That hurts a church. Mm -hmm. And our people have just come, and they've learned, and I just sit over there and learn myself, and uh, give opinions, and that's fine. That's what we want. So if you want to come down, if you have any expertise in that area, anything to contribute, say, I don't have anything to contribute. Well, you like me, I don't have anything to contribute. I just want to see it keep going, and however you want to make sure that it happens, that's fine with me. So just come, and uh, we'll be here at 5 o'clock. Get started promptly on time. And I'll probably be here about 30, 40 minutes at the most. And uh, then we'll see uh, which way we're going to go after this meeting tonight. Delighted to see you today. Glad to have you. Any kind of mitigation you wish to practice is fine with us. So if I stand off to the side over there, as I've been doing for the last many Sunday mornings, ever since we started meeting together again. So if I'm not standing in the doorway, it's not because I don't want to be near you. It's just because um, I don't want to be near you. There you go. Yep. So uh, if you don't want to be near me, uh, I'll have my feelings hurt and be mad at you for a while. No, I'm not going to do that. Either. So you practice whatever you think is appropriate for you and appropriate for other people. Let's have a prayer. Father, prayer is always appropriate. In fact, prayer is required according to your word. It's part of our duty. It's part of our privilege to pray. Help us to do a lot of it. And we've been doing a lot more in the last several months, and that's okay. Because it's prompted us to pray to the one who is in control of all things. Lord, I know nothing about 30 minutes from now, an hour from now, tomorrow. I know nothing until it happens. And I need to put my confidence in thee. Help me to do that. And for thy word in a few minutes, I need thy confidence that the word of God is true as the Lord has led me to study it and give it to my friends and myself. So help me to learn and profit from thee in thy word and close to thee, Lord Jesus. And I pray that everybody else will too. And I pray for those who watch and are not able to be with us. Encourage and strengthen them in the faith. And when someone hears how to be saved, and sees the need in the personal life, maybe someday someone can contact us and say, I saw it, I listened, I responded, and now I'm born again by claiming Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. Lord, be pleased that that should happen, and only thy and thy Holy Spirit can make it happen. So bless this service. In the name of our Savior, I ask, Amen. Amen. Page number six. I sing the mighty power of God. Let's stand one last time before our scripture reading. As we sing all three verses of I sing the mighty power of God.
verses 49 through 56. Remember the word unto thy servant, upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. The proud have had me greatly in derision, yet have I not declined from thy law. I remember thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night, and have kept thy law. This I have, because I kept thy precepts. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for all of the brothers and sisters that are here for us. And we thank you for letting us be here to give us the opportunity in these times of troubles. And we know that all of this is because of you and the work of thy son, who gives us permanent salvation to all who believe in him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Sometimes to sing those songs. Boy, it? boy, it's in the heart. You have it in your mind. And uh, the emotions sort of uh, flow over you, flood you a little bit. You'll have to excuse me. No, you don't have to. Matthew chapter 27. Well, it's great to see you in church. We're now going to the 27th chapter of of Matthew as soon as they get the volume adjusted. I'm going to read starting in verse 51. And when he had cried again with a loud voice, Jesus yielded up the ghost. It's all over now. He had three more sayings that came from the cross after last Sunday morning. He thirsted. He cried out. There's three words in English for us in John's account of the gospel. It is finished. But in the language of his day, it's just one word. Finished. And then he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. So in verse 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks went, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. <clears throat> now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done they feared greatly saying truly that's the other word for amen by the way mm. this was the son of God amen. Mm. and many women were there beholding afar off which followed Jesus from Galilee and ministering unto him among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's children. The end has come. He's uttered his final words. His body is dead. And you do understand God cannot die. But having taken upon himself a body like unto ours, yet without sin, that body could die. And it did. So those that are around the cross see his body. His body is going to be punctured by one of the Roman soldiers to make sure that 
They had ample time to take down three from the crosses and uh, dispose of them. I'm kind of pausing to say that word because unless somebody claimed the bodies, they would be thrown into the city dump. Where there, there were always fires burning. And where usually there were animals that were seeking what animals seek. That's not going to happen to the Son of God. Because it's been predicted, it's been divinely ordained that not a bone of his body will be broken. And even though it will taste death, he will be treated with dignity in his burial. I'm so excited about next Sunday morning. It's hard to stay where I am now. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> he gave up his life. They did not take it from him. Amen. He gave up his life as the darkness ended. All this happens rather quickly. He is victorious. Okay. God's always victorious. Amen. He never fails. <clears throat> He has sealed the New Testament, the New Covenant, the New Promise with his blood. And he's ended all the Old Testament types and shadows and symbols and figures. They're all gone. In fact, if you were to consult, and I have not the time this morning, especially in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, 9, 10, and other locations as well, the work has been done. There is now... No need any longer for a priesthood. It will carry on for another approximately 40 years. But it will all be in vain. It's all just repetitious religion. It means nothing to God because his son has fulfilled everything that God planned him to fulfill. There will be no more sacrifices. He has offered the final sacrifice that put aside all the thousands upon tens of thousands that preceded his coming. Right. He is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. There are no more offerings. People will continue to bring offerings. The priest will continue to offer up blood sacrifices. They will not be accepted by God. That's they don't know that. But eventually it will all come to an end in 70 A.D. The altars, no more sacrifices on the altars. In fact, this beautiful temple building will no longer be needed. And therefore in 70 AD, it will be destroyed. There are a number of miracles that take place in the few verses that I read, especially starting in 51 and going through 53. In fact, I even consider what happens in 54 to be a miracle. Because anytime somebody is born again, and I think these fellows were, that's my opinion now. You say, well, I haven't found that in the Bible. I know you haven't, I just gave you an opinion. I think this man spoke for himself, and he spoke for the other soldiers that were scattered around that area, especially those at the foot of the cross. So I see in his statement here, and in the book of John, I see a statement elsewhere that this was a righteous man, he said in the book of Luke. Truly, it was a righteous man. That means a man who was right. And I'll have more to say about him in, in a few minutes. But these miracles are going to attest to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. First, we start in verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. That means in two parts from the top to the bottom. It would have been impossible to start the bottom and work up. Now, historic records, even from secular sources, tell us that that veil in that temple was 60 feet wide. It's approximately 60 feet from me to the back wall. Up to the ceiling is about 15 to 16 feet. This veil was 60 feet wide and 30 feet high. It was the thickness of a man's hand, maybe even bigger than my hand. It was that thick. It was composed of 72 particular squares of material 
all threaded just right, kind of like a quilt, I suppose, and all put together. And according to historic records, it took almost a hundred priests just to hang the thing, separating the holy place from the holy of holies. Only the priests saw that veil. In fact, in my imagination, at probably three o'clock or give or take a few minutes in the afternoon, Christ has given up his spirit. He's now back in heaven in the face of the heavenly father while his body will be removed and placed in that tomb. And the priests are performing their normal functions. Mm -hmm. Now they've been able to bring themselves back to their sensible positions. Remember, darkness has been over all the land and extending out far into the Mediterranean in my imagination and all to the north and the east and the south as well. It's been total darkness. The only way people are going to be able to go about their business is to grab oil lamps and light them. An earthquake occurs, even according to historic records, an earthquake occurred just about that time and could have been felt almost as far away as Rome. And so the blackness has now begun to dissipate and light is coming again upon the scene. But keep in mind that for three hours, the precious Son of God suffered what you find in verse 46. He is forsaken by God. He has to be forsaken by God because he has now become what he knew from the foundation of the earth and the universe he would be. A sacrifice for sinners. He calls out in that darkness. And I told you last Sunday morning, he asked a question, not of the Father now, because he's there as being the substitute for the judgment of God. It's not a longer relationship between Father and Son, it's now between God and sacrifice. And Christ Jesus has himself become that sacrifice. The high priest would enter once a year, this is not the time, and he would take blood behind that veil into the Holy of Holies. I know what was there before 586 BC, but from that time on, the Ark of the Covenant was no longer there. And I care not for what you may see about unexplained mysteries and historic events on television as to where is the ark. I'm going to tell you I don't know where the ark is and I'm going to tell you that nobody upon earth does. Right. In my imagination, in my opinion, it's in heaven. Well, how could you get an ark like that overlaid with gold in heaven? Well, how could you get anybody into heaven? Elijah, by the way, wasn't taken up by a chariot. Elijah was taken up by a whirlwind. How'd you get Elijah into heaven? Well, whirlwinds can only be so high. Uh, I'm not interested in figuring out how God does what he does. Right. For God can do the impossible. Amen. Amen. So that's why I think the ark is in heaven. In fact, I think that based on the book of Hebrews. But nevertheless, was there an ark there at the time of Christ? It's possible. It would not have been the original. It would have been another one that had been made for the occasion. A couple of other items behind that veil. I have not time for them either. So once a year, the high priest is going to go behind that veil. The other priests never go there. He's going to take blood for himself. He's going to take blood for the whole nation. It's a perfunctionary situation. He will perform what is required of him. Would you consider a priest saved? You'd like to. Would you consider all the priests being in the family of God? You'd think so. But then you can't presume that even with a Baptist church. Because there will always be somebody sitting out there that's never been born again. They've just gone through the motions. So the priest will go through the motions, but later on in the year. Nevertheless, the other priest are before that veil and they're performing various functions that the law required of them and all of a sudden 
this monster-sized veil begins to rip from the top to the bottom. Now you talk about the unseen hand of God. Right. There it is. The unseen hand of God begins to rip that veil. And these priests that are standing before it that have never gone into the Holy of Holies are now going to be standing there dumbstruck in awe as the veil rents in two pieces and they are able to see into the Holy of Holies. They were never allowed to do that, but now they're doing it. And that's what happens when Jesus dies. Why? Why does this happen? You see, in the Old Testament, God had ordained sacrifices and altars and offerings and so forth as pictures, object lessons, if you please, of what people needed to see to understand by faith, that is by trusting in the unknown God, that the unknown God would someday become known to them and therefore he was known in the person of Jesus the Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, and God of gods. Amen. Therefore, this veil is going to be rent in half. Well, what happened to the veil? I do not know. Did they try to sew it back together? Well, that's the thickness of a man's hand, we're told. And it's going to be very difficult. Did they put it all back together? Possibly. But they're going to be dumbfounded right now and, as I said a few minutes ago, awestruck by what's going on. An earthquake is going to take place. You see, the veil is going to show forth in a figure fashion, in a lesson they're going to learn later. And some of them will never learn it. And yet a great number of priests, were told, in the early part of the book of Acts are going to be saved. A great number of the priests. How so? Well, if they were ministering in front of that veil that day, they had to understand this is the hand of God. Yeah. I mean, we, we can't do anything about this. And when the earthquake occurs, this is again the work of God. Yeah. And then when you come in verse 52 and 53 with graves opening and, and bodies appearing, and no wonder. It won't be long before a great number of priests are going to believe in the resurrection of Jesus the Christ and they're going to be saved. Amen. Hmm. So the Old Testament has fulfilled its purpose. And therefore what happens in the first part of verse 51 is a termination, an ending for the law. So all that the law was supposed to accomplish in its shadows and figures and symbols had been fulfilled. And Christ Jesus is the one who fulfills Amen. all of it. Amen. Amen. Now let's go to the let's go to the earthquake. And the earth did quake, and the rocks, indicating huge boulders, are just sort of split in half. This earthquake occurs. Now, this signifies to me the intervention of God. You see, this is the death of the Creator that shakes his creation. Mm -hmm. Darkness and earthquakes testify. Those of us who in Florida and maybe other parts of the country, if you've had the occasion to live or stay home through, an, through a hurricane when all the power went off and you all of a sudden found yourself scrambling for a flashlight or some kind of source of light, and yet at nighttime, there's not a street light anywhere, right. because the power's gone out. Way off in the distance, might be a dimly lit gleam of light coming from somebody's home who's using a generator, and they've got two or three lights on in the house. But I can tell you, my wife and, sat, and I have sat a number of times out on the porch when there was no light anywhere. And it was so dark, we couldn't see one another. I mean, dark. It's kind of like being in Egypt, I often imagine. A darkness over Pharaoh's land. The Bible says it could be felt. Wow. It's, and we know it's only temporary, but it's kind of eerie when you're in just total darkness. Surely there's light coming from some source. But on our street, we've seen where there were no lights. We couldn't even see one. 
Have you ever had an earthquake? I lived overseas for a while in Japan for a couple of years. Uh, we had earthquakes, never on a regular basis. They don't come that way. But once in a while, there'd be an earthquake. It seemed like about every two to three months there'd be an earthquake. And when you first feel it, it just kind of makes your heart tremble all of a sudden. You're not in control. You're inside, so you rush outside. Why? Well, you don't want anything on the inside to fall on you. And you can go back inside, and I don't know what it registered on the Rod Richter scale, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, we, we experienced it, and it was kind of, it was awe-inspiring. I mean, we could stand outside, and for a few seconds, you could see the building just vibrating. How could this, this uh, four, four apartment building that you were in with the second floor, how, how could it all just, just vibrate? Go inside, start picking up the pieces. Now, I've never been in a serious earthquake like Los Angeles experienced several years ago. Not that bad. But it's a, it's a terrifying situation because the first thing you're told is get out of the house. Get out, whatever the building is, get out of the building. Because the building could collapse on you. And you ain't coming out. You'll be carried out eventually. So now the darkness has subsided somewhat. The veil is rid in twain. That's a private miracle for the priest. And now a public miracle for everybody else. A great earthquake takes place. Now there's gonna be another one in just another two or three days, earthquake again. So a great earthquake takes place. Two astounding events in the Bible are identified by earthquake. Now, there are a lot of others. I could go through a, a list of them, and you'd probably recognize every one of them as I started early in the Bible, like in Exodus, and went all the way through, and I showed you every time an earthquake occurred, that took a whole sermon in itself. I have not time for that. But here are the people of God. They've been delivered from Egyptian bondage. They're out in the Sinai Desert area. Moses and Aaron are called up upon Mount Sinai. And the people stand there and they cannot approach the mountain because they're warned if you come within a certain distance of the mountain, you're risking death by the Creator. And the mountain just quakes. And I can see all those probably two, two and a half million people standing there just gazing up at this, this big mountain. It's just, it's moving. It's not a figment of the imagination. The whole thing is moving. I have no idea what Moses and Aaron were experiencing. And so the law was given. And there's thunderings and lightnings all over that mountain. The law is given with all of its requirements, with all of its penalties if you don't obey the law. And that's basically what the law was. The law said thou shalt, the law said thou shalt not. If you don't perform what you're supposed to, there are penalties. If you violate, there are penalties. The law never gave life. The law always spoke of death. Therefore, the Jew was to understand that he lived under the condemnation of the judgment of God. And that's why the tabernacle was so important in their wilderness wanderings and afterwards until the temple was built and still was important. The law was in effect. But when Christ Jesus, who fulfilled all the law, gave up his life, then God was satisfied. He now intervened with another earthquake. The completion of the law has been accomplished. People had to, they, they couldn't have been that dumb. They had to understand the significance of what was taking place, especially those that were following Christ. So darkness and earthquake can terrify, but they can also speak of the judgment of God. Now you can think about this. I'm not going to postulate, but I'm just going to have you think about it for a few seconds. When great and catastrophic events happen in our lifetime, do you not think, is God getting through for the message? Is God saying, I am still in heaven. I still control do you think that Jesus Christ is as the disciples described him on the Sea of Galilee where even the winds 
and the way he is. What manner of man is this? They obey him. And so the judgment of God has come to earth again and never be repeated because God has judged his son. So there's the miracle of the termination of the law and the miracle of the intervention by God and now the miracle of the, of the expectation of a resurrection. You say, you believe verses 52 and 53 happen? Uh, well, they're there. And if they're there, and if God is the author of the book, then they happen. As far as I'm concerned, in the story. But let me see what I can do to help us understand this story a little bit. And the graves were open. Did the earthquake do that? That's very possible. The graves are open. Do you not think that with something like that happening, by the way, graves were not necessarily in the ground. It was very rare. Graves were always in walls, in rock areas, hewn out, if you please. Don't you think people would rush to the graves to see if everything was okay where grandma and grandpa are buried? Uh, well, they might rush, but they're not going in. The reasons why they won't go in. First of all, they're going to be defiled, and they cannot celebrate anything that's happened for the next week and a half. Number two, they're forbidden to be around dead bodies, so they're not going to go in. When the body's once placed there, it's done. Would they stand outside and look and do whatever they want to do, but they're not going in. And the Bible says now, two things are happening. Notice very carefully. The graves were open. Now, in our English Bible, and I think it's appropriate, there is a semicolon there. That means just a slight pause, if you please. It's not only a pause in reading, it's a pause in a time sequence. There has to be a time sequence here. You ready for it? Now, the graves are open. Just pause. Let me speak of it again. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. The graves are open. They're going to stay open for the Sabbath. Nobody's out on the Sabbath, period, for any reason. And the graves are open. And after the Son of God arises from the dead, then those bodies that were in those graves are going to exit. Now let me see if I can help us visualize this. In my opinion, these are people who have newly passed away. He said, where do you get that? It's just an opinion. Well, I have no scripture for that. There are other people who say, well, this could have been Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and, and all those characters. I'm probably not, but it could have been. It could have been. I don't have an argument with some theologian that says, well, that's what I teach in my classes. Teach whatever you want. I'm doing the teaching now, so here we go. <laughs> I think these are recent relatives, recent friends. Why? The graves are open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, who living at that time would have said, that's got to be Elijah? But that, now, that's most, no, 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 wait a minute. That's not, that, that's Abraham. No, no. I think they recognized who they were. How would they have recognized who they were? Probably because their recent occupants, as far as the body is concerned, of those graves. So the Bible says, there are saints which slept, their bodies, notice in verse 52, their bodies arose. Hear me well. Bodies sleep. Not in the literal sense of the word, but in the imaginative, figurative sense of the word, it appears as though they're sleeping. It's a word of appearance. So bodies sleep. Believers don't. Paul said it. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Remember? Yeah. All right. Bodies do. Believers don't. Tombs are now open, but not entered by the living. Those in the tombs, I think, probably were known 
to friends and relatives at that time in Jerusalem. They're going to make an appearance. All right, here comes the curious questions for which I have no answers. That may satisfy you anyway. So these people appear after the resurrection of Christ. He is the first fruits, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians. What happens to these people? Okay, let's go to Lazarus. What happened to Lazarus? Well, he was raised from the dead. Agreed? Did Lazarus die again? Yeah, I think he did. Did these people die again? No, wait, wait. No, I don't think they did. Jesus Christ and they arose in commemoration and as a picture, a very living, if you please, very living picture of his resurrection that took place before sunrise that Easter Sunday morning. And now, after his resurrection, these bodies appear. These are people that God has brought back from heaven. Well, how can you do that? Because heaven's a real place. Huh? Now, if it's an imaginary place, then just let your imagination run wild. And uh, you're left up to your own figurative imagination. These people are brought back from heaven. They're going to utilize on a temporary basis for a few hours their original bodies. Well, then what's going to happen to these people? The only thing I can tell you is to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And since they appear in glorified bodies, they have to be glorified bodies. The other bodies have been decaying. So these are good, wholesome, new bodies, recognizable as people are in heaven. And so they're going to appear to their friends and to their relatives. Will they touch one another? Possible. Will they talk to each other? Possible. Will they get any information about heaven? Probably not. But they're going to meet. And then when all the meeting is over, to add more evidence for the greatest impact of all, a crucified and dead Savior in the minds of most people. But he's not dead. Only his body is dead, remember? And his body is resurrected from the grave in a glorified fashion. A body that was no longer bound by time and space and the material. A body that could appear where the disciples were gathered on that first Sunday evening. A body that could appear and disappear. Walk along the road with disciples. <laughs> Sit down and have a meal. Vanish. How can they do that? I don't know. You have to take that up with God. But that's what's happening. And these people are going to be visible for a little while. And they're going to be taken bodily back. In. How do you think Jesus got where he is? If you go to Acts chapter 1, you'll find out. This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven. His disciples stood there and they watched him rising. He's rising. He's in the clouds. He's gone. And this same Jesus, the messengers from heaven, those angels said, is coming again in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. When he comes again, he's coming in a body. That's right. He's coming in the body that he took from death and changed it. Just like he's going to change our bodies one of these days. But in the meantime, until that happens, we are going to be with the Lord in some kind of a body. We're going to be present with him forever. So after Jesus' resurrection, they make their appearance. Whatever transpires in that appearance takes place, and they're taken back into heaven. Now, God's Son is attested by signs. The sign of the miracles that I've just given you. Termination of the law in the first part of verse 51. The sign of the intervention by God in verse 51, the latter part. And then in 52 and 53, the expectation of a resurrection. I've got to hurry to verse 54. Oh, this is exciting. These men have uh, been trained in a harsh manner. These soldiers are accustomed to iron discipline. To say the least, they must prove themselves to be courageous. 
according to historic records, it's very possible that this, this group of men that were stationed in Jerusalem, they would have been brought over from the seacoast up to Jerusalem for this event because you gotta have more troops, <coughs> pardon me, it's like calling in the National Guard when things get out of control. And so the National Guard is on standby, if you please, in Jerusalem, just in case the mobs become unruly and must be controlled. Hint, hint. So anybody with any authorities listening? Okay. <laughs> and they say, according to historic records, that they were probably from Gaul. That would have been Damn. interesting. And these men are going to become the first fruits, if you please, after the resurrection of Christ, of a vast army of Gentiles to come. And that's us. Yeah. What's a centurion? Well, he's in charge of an officer in charge of 100 men. There would be at least four for each cross. So four times three is uh, 12. I think probably there were some more around. I think probably they had an outer layer, if you please. Make sure the crowds are under control. Make sure that nobody burst in. Nobody tries to take some thief down from the cross before he's dead. None of his buddies show up and create a problem. So I think, in my imagination, there are just lots of soldiers kind of even mingling in among all the people. Now, I take you quickly, you've got to turn quickly to the book of John. I'm not quite finished, and I know what time it is. I want to go to the 19th chapter of John. I'll read as quickly as I can from John chapter 19. If you find it hurriedly, you can keep up with me. If you don't find it in the next 10 seconds, then just listen. Verse 7, the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law we ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee, from above. Amen. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now let's go back to where we are. Is it possible that this centurion and the soldiers, at least the ones that he had called out of the barracks, positioned them in the crowd, positioned them around the cross, had heard Jesus early that morning, just a few hours ago, with those very statement of our Lord, that very statement. Is that possible? Is it possible that he had witnessed the scourging of Christ? Is it possible that his soldiers had participated in the scourging while he stood off in the corner somewhere and let it happen? Is it possible? Is it possible that somewhere in Israel, as he would have moved about once in a while, that he had met people who knew Jesus? Is it possible that he had even seen him? Is it possible that perhaps he had heard him preach? Is it possible that he had seen him perform a miracle or more? Well, with God, all things are possible. And therefore, when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. They knew there would be no threat. They knew it was harmless. They were terrified by the darkness. They never experienced anything like that. They were terrified by the earthquake. They're probably not aware of the private miracle that took place in the temple building itself. But I want, I, I've got to take time to call your attention to a verb at the end of verse 54. Now, this is how they would have understood it as far as Jesus was concerned. In their minds, he was dead. <coughs> or he's going to be dead very quickly now. That's the way they're going to see it. So they're going to use a verb that carries with us the idea 
This was the Son of God. But now it's all over. Stay with me. I want you to notice that verb at the end of verse 54. W-A-S. You don't see this in English because we don't have quite the equivalent in English. Not all grammar transfers just flipping like one, one language to another language. There are always inconsistencies, idiosyncrasies in language, special deals, irregular verbs, and so forth and so on. Listen to me carefully. This word that is divinely recorded by inspiration of God, W-A-S, I've already told you what it seemed to be to the men in that uh, squadron. He was the Son of God. Listen carefully. This is a verb in divine inspiration that is different from our past tense, W-A-S. It's called an imperfect tense. You say, well, I, I remember that in my grammar. Don't worry about it. Stay with me. It's an imperfect tense verb. It means something or an action that was in the past that is continuing along, moving on. That's an imperfect tense. I'm going to, forgive me, I'm going to translate it for you so that you'll get the gist of what I'm trying to tell you. This was the Son of God, and he is. Amen. You understand, Brother Stephen? You've been looking in the Greek. You like that. This was the Son of God, and he is. To us, this was. Okay, it, it, it was. Yesterday was Saturday. Okay, end of Saturday. To them, they believed that he was the Son of God. But they knew nothing about him theologically. And I'm giving you a theological input here in the sense that he was. And the verb requires that it still be continued. He was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. Now, if you want to add to it, I don't care. And he always will be. If he is and God is eternal, then he always will be. There is no past with God. There is no future with God. There's only a present with God. So he was and is the Son of God. Amen. And that's why I think, yeah, that's why I think they trusted him as their Savior. Oh, by the way, our Lord had uttered a prayer. In fact, he uttered it, according to Luke, several times. And that's the early stage of the cross. And the words that our Lord uttered were these. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now listen to me. He's asking the Father to do something. And I think the Father does it right here. These guys. These guys. Luke says they recall him as being a righteous man. They would have said that to nobody else. He could have cared. Could not have cared less. And they know now who he is. They may not understand all the impact, but they know who he is. And I don't think they're going to be surprised uh, in another couple of days when he rises from the dead. The courage of the women, they ministered according to the scripture. How did they minister? Uh, repairing clothing? Helping to wash clothes? Take care of meals? The Bible speaks of quite a large number of them. It's not just uh, three or four that are named here. Quite a few women uh, they followed to meet the needs in the very, very holiest of ways to meet the needs of Jesus and all the disciples. And so they're there. Mary Magdalene, uh, her name carries Magdalene because she was from the village of Magdala. So she would be a Magdalene from Magdala, which is just a stone's throw from Capernaum. That was the the uh, northern kingdom, so to speak, of Jesus' ministry. And she's there. Early in his ministry, Jesus is in that area, and he casts seven demons out of her. Her life now is devoted to him. No man ever could do something like that for her. So she bowed her will to be his will, and wherever he was, I suppose she was nearby. 
she can do whatever it took to show her gratefulness to her, to her Savior. The other relatives are mentioned, I don't have time to go into them, they're relatives, probably a couple of aunts of our Lord's on the Mary and Joseph side. Much, much devotion is seen here to a criminal, a false prophet, a deceiver, as they were told he was. And yet see their courage. They stand around the cross. John's the only one nearby. John takes Mary under his wing. That's the mother of our Lord. And I think in my imagination, John takes the other women and he says to them, it's, it's, it's time to move on. It's, we need to move on. Who knows, the mob may be getting a little bit rowdy. After all, they've experienced three hours in darkness. They've experienced a horrific earthquake. They've now heard the news that all around the area of Jerusalem, graves have been opened. They don't want to make it that. All graves are sealed. These are all over. And they're getting uh, antsy. They're getting upset. You never know what a mob's going to do. And therefore, I think John says, ladies, we, we're, we're going to move. We're going to move off to the side. After all, they're going to have to take these bodies down from the cross. And they're going to go to the room to do that. So that's why the Bible says that they were beholding afar off, ministering as they had to the Lord. Such devotion. It probably put us to shame. How devoted are we to Christ? So, this was the Son of God. Still is. Always will be. All I can say is what I said last week. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Stand with me for prayer, please. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed for prayer. Is he your Savior? Are you sure? In the Sunday school hour for my class, I taught about proof. What proof do you have? Well, I put my faith in him, all right? Then what has he given you as proof that you're in the family of God? And always my mind goes back to promises. Oh, he makes promises. He himself makes promises. And then they're made in the scripture as well. Oh, the promises of God. That's your proof. That's all the proof you need. God made me promises. And I claim those promises. That's how I know that I'm born again. Father in heaven, if someone in this building needs to be born again, this is the time. This is the place. Someone who has viewed and heard needs to be born again. Then wherever that person is, make it the time and the place. In the Savior's name I pray. Amen. Now our heads are still bowed for an attitude of prayer. Sandy will play just a couple of verses. Not a long invitation. If you're not sure that you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you need to make sure. You need to have assurance of your salvation, and you'll find that assurance in the words that I gave you a minute or two ago. Promises. Trust God's promises. They never fail. They cannot fail. That's how you'll know you're saved. Emotions are fine, but they can be deceiving. Make sure you know Christ is your Savior. Christian, devote your life to him. He loved you and gave himself for you. He lives again for you and me. What concern, what compassion in that song that Brother Young sang a little while ago. Oh, what he's done for us. So how can I do less than give him my best and live for him completely after all he's done for me?